It's another edition of Time About the Movies, and today we're taking a look at the films of May 7th, 2004. We got three films to look at today, and uh, most of them are mostly disappointments, which is coincidental because this weekend was the end of Friends, the long-running TV series on NBC the day before. It was supposed to be watched by 80 million viewers. It was watched by only 50 million, and even then, the people that saw the finale were kind of let down by it. Maybe not to the levels of Seinfeld, that, but... Um, but it was not very well received at first. But unlike the Seinfeld finale, which has gotten worse in the thirty years since it's in the near thirty years since it aired, um, not that bad honestly. But um, it was just part. It should have been the sign of a disappointing weekend to come for most of the new releases because we've got two notable new releases to kick off the summer movie season that the studios had high expectations for, and then they just <laughs> fell off. It fell off into existence and. Um, Let's start off with the biggest of them all, and that is um, Hugh Jackman in uh, trying to cash in on his success with Wolverine in the X-Men movies in Stephen Sommer's Van Helsing. My life, my job, my curse is to vanquish evil. His name is Van Helsing. Some say you're a holy man. Others say you're a murderer. Which is it? It's a bit of both. He has come to a forbidden land to battle enemies that are legend. Oh my god. This summer, evil has one name to fear. Hugh Jackman is. Wow, almost none of that happens in this movie. Um, that's just It just gives you a sneak preview of the disappointment that is to come, because this was a massive disappointment, not just in terms of the movie itself, but the box office as well. And um, yeah, Hugh Jackman stars as Van Helsing and is in this world to rid all evil, even if not everyone agrees with him. The Vatican sends the monster hunter and his ally Carl to Transylvania. They've been sent there to the land to stop the powerful Count Dracula, played by Richard Roxborough, when they are joined forces with a gypsy princess called Anna Valerius, played by Kate Beckinsale, who is determined to end an ancient curse on her family by destroying the vampire. They just don't know how. And, um, yeah, this film, you could pretty much tell from the trailer, everything bad about this movie comes out of the floodgates right away. The horrible, horrible visual effects in this movie that were bad back then, but have somehow gotten even worse 20 years later. I mean, oh my god. This is unbelievable how bad the visual effects are. I mean, these are terrible CG effects in this movie. And it's just like... And the plan was that supposedly they were going to do practical effects, but Universal basically came in and said, nope, CG, CG it up. Because, you know, heaven forbid, you know, the greatest trans the greatest werewolf transformation in all of history in American Werewolf in London, but it would have been so much better if it was CG, right? Right? Hello? Anyone out there? Anyone out there agree with us? And no. No, we don't agree with the Universal. Like, it's like this every time, too. They try to they try to make the argument that, well, practical effects just don't pale in comparison to the CG, because that's exactly what happened with the Wolfman, too. The Wolfman was going to use the remake of this Isio del Toro was going to use practical effects, but Universal basically said, no, we're going to go with CG effects because that's because that's the way of the future. And yeah, that movie didn't end up working out either. And I'm guaranteeing you right now, this new Wolfman movie that's coming out pretty soon, watch them use CG again. Yeah, they're going to keep pretending like practical effects are no no use anymore. And as that film, American Werewolf in London, has shown over 40 years later, that shit still holds up and is still terrifying today. I'm sorry, when I see these creep people turning into wolves in this movie... There's nothing scary about it whatsoever. In fact, there's nothing really scary about the movie in general. This is supposed to be an homage to classic Universal monsters. This is about as big of a disappointment and a letdown of the Universal monsters as the Dark Universe was. And that was a rough stretch of movies there. Even though there was only one movie, but still, their pl that plan they had all together to like to do what the MCU and DC were doing was just, just a horrible idea altogether. And, I mean, I can't really blame Hugh Jackman for this because, honestly... It's not his fault the movie is bad. He's the only one that's really trying to hold it together. 
and it's just not enough to carry the load. There's only one other thing about this movie that I think really does hold up well, and that is um, the over-the-top Count Dracula, played by Richard Roxborough, who I'm sorry, like, him and his wife are probably the funniest things in the entire mo movie because of just how over-the-top and how just scenery they're chewing up, and you can't help but laugh your ass off at something. It's like, he's supposed to be the threat, but I'm sorry, he makes me laugh out loud, and I don't, I'm pretty sure that was not the intentions whatsoever. Picture it this way. Imagine Arnold Vosloo in the Mummy movies, except intentionally, except even funnier. That's how crazy this gets. I mean, he's the one thing, he's, he's the one thing about that, this movie that makes me laugh considerably. Everything else is just garbage. Kate Beckinsale is a lackluster and sidekick to this. There's nothing really all that spectacular about her in this. Um, the rest of the creatures are pretty useless. Frankenstein doesn't really do a whole lot here either. The trailer completely lies to you and says that they're they're a big part of the storyline when they're really not, and it's just I feel like I feel like Universal was hoping that the, Stephen Sommers could do the same thing he did with the Mummy. But the difference is between the Mummy and this is that you're tackling with all these different classic Universal monsters, and that's been Universal's biggest problem for years now with the Universal monsters. They have no idea. They've really had a hard time trying to adapt them to the modern to the modern filmmaking elements, to the modern filmmaking, and Sometimes they get it right. I mean, the Invisible Man remake they did with um, uh, Elizabeth Moss was actually pretty good. And you know, I've always said, you know, why not just get him? To, why not just get Jason Blum's company to do these? Because they can make them on the cheap. They can make them look cooler. And they, Jason, say what you will about Jason Blum and his Blumhouse Studios. More, more times than not, they will make a profitable movie and a successful movie with a smaller budget. Yeah. With a smaller budget, and I think they could make this work with the Universal monsters going forward, which I think is the plan with the Wolfman. So I'm really hoping that they can work on, they can make it work that way. But with this, it's just like they were really trying to make you think that this was going to be, this was going to be that type of a, is a movie that was going to link into a fr franchise. And I'm sorry, it doesn't work when the visual effects in here are pretty terrible. They were terrible back in 2004. They have not aged well at all after all these years, and just. There's nothing worthy about this movie whatsoever, except the things that I just mentioned. But um, yeah, it was not a good way to start the to start the year off, and not too surprisingly, the weekend box office was not great for it. I mean, I mean, excuse me, I almost broke there for a second. But um, the box office in general wasn't great either. Yeah, it made 50, it made fifty one million on its opening weekend, which isn't bad, especially when you consider you know Spider, you know it's not Spider Man or X Men, but still pretty big for this time of the year. But it came crashing and burning once the word got out, and it was pretty obvious that this wasn't going to fly anywhere. And like I said, it's not Hugh Jackman's fault that the movie is terrible. It's just a bad idea that really doesn't work because of how bad the visual effects are. And you could get away with it with the Mummy movies, because those movies are intentionally supposed to be silly, over-the-top fun. This movie was trying to be too serious, and it just backfires big time in a number of different ways, and... Uh, yeah, it's just not a very good movie, so yeah, avoid uh, Van Helsing like the plague. So, so that was the big budget flop of the weekend. Uh, Want to see this one that nearly killed? Uh, here's the one that nearly killed uh, the careers of Mary Kay and Ashley Olsen, and that is New York Minute. The chess is on. Two girls, twins, on the run from this guy. <laughs> Unspeakable crimes of skipping school, stealing a dog, falling, flirting, flying, and generally being a bad girl, bad girl. New York Minute. What you gonna do when I come for you? Put it PG. Step out of it. Starts Friday, May 7th. <laughs> that was bad. Eugene Levy, why? Like, in bringing down the house when you did, you got me straight tripping boo. That was at least funny, but that. That's the that was the main focus of their comedy. If that's not an indication of how bad this movie is, then quite frankly, we have a lot. We have a lot, we clearly do not need to be friends here. But um, this is New York Minute. Uh, this was a movie that was a very big deal when it came out because it was Mary Kay and Ashley Olsen's first theatrical release since the first time they went to the big screen with It Takes Two back in 1995, and people were curious about that because Troll House had just ended. They wanted to see how these girls would do in a motion picture, and it was okay for what it was. Nothing too spectacular, but this was the one that everyone really had their hands on. 
everyone wanted to see what, what was going to happen because these two were about to turn 18. They were about to get all this money from, the, from what they had done with the direct-to-video movies. Their success came from those direct-to-video movies that they made. And it was a weird time, too. Like, everybody... But, like, there was, a, there was a, literally a space on the internet where they were where people were just waiting for the Olsen twins to get older, to get to 18, and be like, jackpot, baby. It's just like, dude. Like, but then again, you should... But then again, I should have probably figured that out because the internet can be a very dark and scary place sometimes. Even today, it is. But, um... But I digress. And, um... Uh, so there was a lot of hype and expectations for this to do very well. And, um... Needless to say, it did not, and uh, basically, it basically ended the career of Mary Kate and that, of of the Olsen twins as we know. I mean, Ashley basically decided to retire from film and basically went on to become a a, a businesswoman for um she wanted to become a businesswoman for something I can't remember what she has like a fashion career now going on here. And Mary Kate did try to continue making movies. I think she was in one other movie. Uh, Beastly, which came out about seven years later, which wasn't really any better. It was basically the Twilight equivalent of Beauty and the Beast. But, um, but yeah, they really haven't done a whole lot since then, and mostly because, I mean, once Full House ended and they did It Takes Two, besides those director video movies, they really did not have any idea of what to do next. I mean, they had three different TV shows to try to cash in on their success, you know. Uh, there was Two of a Kind on ABC, which lasted one season. There was that animated show they did for ABC as well, Mary Kay and Ashley in Action, which didn't last very long either. They even did a show for, um, again, ABC, ABC Family, with so little time, which, again, only lasted one season. And I think by this point, their audiences basically just grew up and wanted to see them actually do something besides just being the two kids from Full House. And they just really couldn't, they really couldn't um, get back get back to that where they once were before it's funny now that the most popular Olsen right now is Elizabeth Olsen the little is the the I think she's the um is she the is she the uh, younger sister or the older sister now I'm kind of curious younger sister by about three years but yeah you get kind of the idea here and um, I haven't even talked about the movie itself because if the movie had been better and maybe had worked it could work on its own maybe they could have actually had a successful career but you saw the trailer there. You saw how bad this was, but... Yeah, Mary Kay and Ashley portraying twins with opposing personalities who have a series of adventures around New York City. Doesn't that sound like all their movies, pretty much? It's literally the si That's the biggest problem with the movie. It's literally the same goddamn movie every single time, except one time they're in Hawaii, one time they're in Los Angeles, one time they're in Australia. There's a thread of a story going on in here, and this time around they've got bigger na names in the cast because it's on the big screen, you know? Bigger names being Eugene Levy... Uh, Andy Richter, who was still trying to, still trying to have a career after after leaving Conan O'Brien, even though I think he's very funny. He did have a great show that got canceled after two seasons on Fox. Um, uh, Andrea Martin, very funny character actress. Uh, Jared Padalecki, a year and a half before he became more well known with Supernatural. Yeah, this this uh, Bob Saget's in it too, and even though he doesn't really say anything, it was the first time they they were together since Full House ended, and. Uh, I'm literally grasping at straws here to find anything of noteworthiness here, but I'm sorry. There's really not a whole lot there. There is, however, one thing, though. There's one thing about this movie that I think is pretty damn awesome, and you don't even have to watch the movie to, to see it. It's right at the very beginning of the film. That rock version of As Time Goes By, the Warner Brothers logo, did not need to go that hard, but man, that's a great oh, that's a great opening. You could just stop the movie right there and it'd be like, well, the movie wasn't great, but at least that opening was pretty awesome. But um, yeah, other than that, though, this is a pretty bad movie. And like I said, it's bad because it's literally the same movie that they've done for that they've done in direct to is in director video films for years, except this time it's in a different location. And Warner Brothers really thought to themselves that this was going to be the this was going to be the work on the big screen. And not everything can work that way. Yeah, High School Musical was that one exception later on down the road where people can watch it on TV. People can watch it on TV, but they were watching it on TV for free, and that would end up becoming a success later on down the road with the third film. But it doesn't work every single time. Like you have to. Like, if they had actually given them a movie where the Olsons can branch out, you know, do something that is not outside of their norm, do something that's completely different, do something where they show that, hey, 
we got is we got the potential to make to become actresses in the future, real actresses in the future, and it's just this is just not that movie. Plus, it's very offensive too. There's a lot of ethnic stereotyping and really awkward sexual innuendo. Keep in mind, this was made before they turned 18, so this is also kind of bordering on. Not cool. Okay, maybe not blank check levels of of ewiness, but at the same. But with that said, it's still pretty. It's still pretty, pretty um, uncomfortable at times here. And yeah, like I said, they really are not doing the same anything di that different compared to the original. Mo compared to the director video movies, you can watch the director video movies, and you can pretty much just watch the same movie here, except without the big cast they have here. And I'm looking at some of the names in here. There's some names I haven't mentioned here. Daryl Hammond's in the movie from Saturday Night Live. Uh, Drew Pinsky, Jack Osborne, um, H. John Benjamin is in the movie. Bob from Bob's Burgers, Archer, uh, Simple Plan is in here. Like the cast is there, but just there's nothing there in terms of a story that works. There's nothing there in terms of a movie that really it feels like it deserves to be seen on the big screen. It's just a movie that is just really, really lacklusterly put together, and it's just like. Warner Brothers looked at this and pretty much said, well, if this worked in direct -to video form, clearly it's going to work on the big screen, and it doesn't. It just does not, and it's a shame, because, you know, quite honestly, I would have liked to see what Mary Kane and Ashley Olsen would have done in their careers had they gotten, you know, handed more adult scripts. Maybe if they took that road, like these child stars do, that these child stars don't usually do, like, go, like, go, go and do some of these more adult roles. Take the Drew Barrymore route, you know, take the, um... Uh, take the Jennifer Lawrence route. I mean, show us what you can do. Take the Elizabeth Olsen route. I mean, show us what you can do as actresses outside of your norm. But instead, they just kind of went back to doing the same thing and hoping for the best when, unfortunately, it just doesn't work that way here. And, again, I felt like they could... I really do feel like they could have had so much more to work with, but it just doesn't really work out in the end. And it's really a lackluster film that just feels like... One of their directed video movies blown up for the big screen and given a budget, given a much bigger supporting cast, and not really anything else there to really save it from being anything more than just a really lackluster film in general. And it was a massive failure for them because, like I said, it basically ended their careers in film pretty much. But they've gone on to have a, somewhat of a successful career in the world of fashion, so I guess it's not completely over for them. But, I mean, plus they've got that money they made from Full House. I would assume that they had, that. That they would have gotten that money, or maybe it was maybe it's enough. Maybe it's like Macaulay Culkin. Maybe he didn't get all that money back. That maybe he didn't get all that money. They didn't get all that money. Like he did, like, like he did, didn't get all that money. But then again, uh, maybe he's back in the spotlight. We've already talked about one of his movies back in two thousand three, and he's got another movie coming up at the end of the month that we'll get to that I thought was really good. But um, but yeah, as you can pretty much tell, uh, no New York Minute. There's not really much more to say about it. It's about as it's about what you expect it to be, a blown-up director video movie with a bigger budget, a bigger cast, but nothing really that good of value to it whatsoever. So, um, so yeah, we've had two big disappointments so far to this weekend, but uh, we could finally get we could get to a good film finally because last up on the list here we have Morgan Spurlock's Super Size Me. Founder with cheese meal. I think I'm gonna have to go super size. It's hard for me to watch him go through this. It seems like you're starting to get addicted to it now. Use all these numbers, right? These numbers are outrageous. Unfortunately, you caused some major harm to your heart, your liver, your blood. You're gonna die. You'll die. I want more, 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 more. You gotta stop it. <laughs> Unfortunately, as of the time of recording this, Morgan Spurlock has passed away, and it's a shame because the guy was a really damn good documentary filmmaker. He made a he made a really great Simpsons uh, 20th anniversary special for Fox back in the day that. Um, it's really hard to find online, but I remember having it on tape somewhere, and unfortunately, I don't remember. I don't know how to uh, transfer my videos to D my videos to DVDs, or else I would put put it up. But um, it's a really great. I do remember the special a lot, and you know, this was a movie that really opened a lot of people's eyes. About it was a movie that basically changed the game in terms of how these fast food companies do their thing. Because as you could tell from the from the trailer there, uh, Spurlock's film follows a 30-day period between February and March of 2003 during which he claims to consume only McDonald's food, although later he 
said that he was drinking heavy amounts of alcohol, too. And the film documents the drastic change in Spurlock's physical and psychological health and well-being and explores the fast food industry's corporate influence, including how it encourages poor nutrition for its own profit and plan. And it's spread a lot of debate about public eating habits and has since come under scrutiny for the accuracy of its science and the truthfulness of Spurlock's on-camera claims. And in the movie, he eats at McDonald's three times a day, consuming every item on the chain menu at least once. He's claimed to have eaten uh, about nine Big Macs during the, per day during the experiment, uh, walked about two kilometers a day, an intake of about 2,500 kcal within a healthy, balanced diet, and more generally recommended for a man to maintain his weight. And at the end of the experiment, he's gained 25 pounds and a 13 body mass increase increasing his cholesterol, experiencing mood swings, sexual dysfunction, fat accumulation in his liver, throwing up a lot too, and yeah, like, this guy really did take a lot of chances here. Like, Look, I love McDon I love myself some McDonald's every once in a while. I'll eat fast food every once in a while, but I could never do, I don't think anybody could ever do what this guy did. I mean, I can't even do the things that they do at the Nathan's Hot Dog Competition. Like, you think I can eat all those hot dogs in 10 minutes? You're out your goddamn mind. Like, like, I don't know, but it's just, I don't know. Like, to me, like, I could never do anything that this guy did, but it did open the floodgates overall on how these fast food companies do their business. McDonald's literally got rid of their supersized menu not too long after this, and that's, you know, it tells you a lot when a movie like this leaves that much of a lasting impact, and, you know, I think it's a, it's a very interesting little documentary that really shows... The, the, the dark sides of eating too much fast food the way that this guy does because, yeah, he may have he may have aggravated it a little bit more by drinking a lot of alcohol and doing other things, but it does have... The overall message of the film does work out in the movie's favor. It's a movie that really is not afraid to tell you the cold hard truth about eating that much fast food in a single day, and it's just... It's an engaging and invigorating watch to see. I mean, it's a really good film. And it really uh, propelled Morgan Spurlock to another level. Like, he eventually became kind of a second banana to Michael Moore as one of the best documentary filmmakers out there. And coincidentally, Michael Moore has another movie coming is to, that will have come out later on this year, but to, later on this summer. But we'll get to that one a little bit later on. But, um, yeah, this is a really good documentary. It's one of those ones that I can't recommend enough. And especially now that he's no, no longer with us, it's probably now a good time to go check this movie out again because it is something that really has held... It surprisingly has held up well over time, over the 20 years since it's come out. And um, it's a really good movie, man. I can't recommend it enough. It's a great documentary. Uh, it's an amazing film. Uh, Super Size Me. And so on that note, we wrap up another edition of Time About the Movies. The next time we meet, we'll take a look at three more movies. Uh, Brad Pitt starring in the action, uh, the action epic Troy from Wolfgang Peterson. Jamie Foxx, who's going to have a big breakout year in 2004 with a romantic comedy breaking all the rules, kicking it off with Gabrielle Union in the cast as well. And we also have Jim Jarmusch's Coffee and Cigarettes. So we'll take a look at those three movies on the next episode. Uh, but until then, thank you so much for watching. And if you want to see more videos like this, please hit the plays on the next page. Check out the previous episode. And also don't forget to hit the like and subscribe button if you want to see more videos like this on this channel. And so, and oh, I just, I just did the thing already. I, his, um, take two, because I'm not stopping right now. Uh, stay tuned, because coming up after I post this, time about the movie Splashback is all new. We're heading into the, we're heading to the end of 1988. We only got a couple weeks to go. We're looking at January 22nd, and we've got uh, six movies to look at: Braddock, Missing in Action, Three, Five Corners, The Telephone, Promised Land, The Family, King Lear. So we'll take a look at those six movies on Time About the Movie Splashback, which will be coming up right after this. So stay tuned.